It's the dog days of summer, a perfect time to take a dip in the pool, pour yourself some lemonade, and listen to the Paperback Warrior Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to the Paperback Warrior Podcast. My name is Eric, and this is episode 53 of the show where we discuss vintage paperback fiction in the spy, crime, western, and adventure genres. We also have a blog with daily reviews at paperbackwarrior.com and a thriving Facebook community where you can see the beautiful cover art from these old books and join the discussion. Let me introduce my writing and broadcast partner, Tom, who's going to tell you about today's episode. Today's feature is about an author named Kendall Foster Crossan, who had a popular pulp series called The Green Llama. Under the pseudonym of M.E. Chobber, he authored a series of mystery spy adventures starring a character named Milo March that you should know about. Tied into that, I'll be reviewing the second book in the series, No Grave for March, from 1953. Eric, what's your review today? Again, I'm going to modernize things a little bit. I'm going to be reviewing the debut novel in Lauren D. Estelman's Amos Walker series. It's a 1980 paperback called Motor City Blue. Nice. Uh, Okay, so before we get into the feature, uh, we got some odds and ends to attend to. Eric, one of my favorite reprint publishers is Starkhouse Books. And several episodes ago, I asked you to tell me, or to guess rather, what Starkhouse's all-time bestseller was. And the answer was this very helpful reference guide by Brian Witt called Paperback Confidential. So my follow-up question to you is, what was the best-selling Starkhouse release in the year 2019? I am going to guess. Lay it on me. All right, so I'm going to do two. The first one would be that short story collection that they did early last year called uh, Redheads Die Quickly by Gil Brewer. My other guess, that compilation that they did of all the short stories, the... uh, you know what I'm talking about. No, I have no idea what you're talking about. The second one. Uh, the best of man, the manhunt. Yes, yes, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. And you are correct. Okay. The, uh, the second one, the first one, you're insane. Uh, <laughs> okay. All the redhead dies, redheads die quickly is an excellent compilation of short stories by Gil Brewer. It was not their bestseller from 2019. The correct answer is The Best of Manhunt, a short story anthology of stories from Manhunt Magazine, the best of the crime fiction magazines. The magazine ran from 1953 to 1967, and the short stories and novellas from it really mirror the hard-boiled crime stuff we cover on the podcast and the blog. We reviewed the anthology on the site and called it the most important crime fiction anthology, maybe ever. And of course, America listened and bought lots and lots of copies. And now the Starkhouse guys are flying around the country in private jets while you and I talk to the same 350 retirees (laughs) using AOL dial-up every week on this lousy podcast. There's no justice, dude. Amen to that. Well, the reason I bring it up is because those Starkhouse millionaires weren't raised by no dummies. In August 2020, they're going to be releasing The Best of Manhunt, Volume 2, edited by Jeff Vorzimmer. It's over 400 pages filled with short stories from the magazine. I was able to score an advanced copy. Let me uh, throw a copy to you right here. I don't know if you looked at this yet. And uh, and it looks great, right? I'm not going to read the entire... What do you think? Looks oh, good. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, it looks amazing. <laughs> I, I'm not going to read you the entire table of contents, but there's short stories in there by Ross McDonald, Bruno Fisher, Leslie Charteris, Henry Kane, David Goodis, and more. It's just sort of a who's who. At some point during the next month, I'm going to read a bunch of the short stories and review the book on the paperbackwarrior.com blog. Uh, although I really haven't cracked the code on the best way to make a short story anthology review worth a damn, I, I just don't know how to do that. Uh, But I'll just review a bunch of the short stories and recommend the book. Anyway, you can pre-order your copy from Amazon uh, today. It's available or or just directly at the Starkhouse Books website. Hopefully it'll be another hit for Starkhouse, so they'll do a volume three next year. We need this because I never see any copies of that magazine in the wild. It is weird, isn't it? Uh, And so as if we haven't done enough shilling for Starkhouse, there's another release I, I need to mention that's also coming out in August on their Black Gat Books imprint. Uh, which does the mass market paperbacks, um, not the big trade paperbacks, the smaller ones, which is why I, I really like the Black Gat books. The book is called Little Sister, and it was originally came out in 1952 under the pseudonym of Lee Roberts, and it's being reprinted under the author's real name of Robert Martin with an introduction by Bill Pronzini, who was friends with Mr. Martin. 
It's a crime noir novel about a woman who hires a guy named Bryce to convince her little sister not to marry a guy. And somewhere along the way, the little sister winds up uh, with a dead body in her trunk and mayhem ensues. It looks great. I got another Lee Roberts book here called The Judas Journey that I need to read also. I haven't read any of Robert Martin or Lee Roberts' uh, books before, but I know he's highly regarded. The guy wrote 23 detective novels under his own name and the Lee Roberts pseudonym between 1951 and 1964. He died in 1976. Funny side note. Stark House and Black Gat have been stepping up their cover art game lately. And so I just handed you a copy of the Little Sister reprint. Um, sometimes they throw a curveball, though, with their cover art. The original art uh, for Little Sister was a faucet gold medal uh, with its own cover. And you have a copy of that, right? You have a copy yes. of the original Little Sister. But the cover art used on the Black Gat reprint was drawn by Rudy Nappy, and it originally appeared in the book Reefer Girl mm. by Jane Manning. So everything old is new again at Stark House. I, I would say that Stark House's um, artwork has really improved. Uh, I think they heard people's complaints, right? Like, because their their old artwork was terrible, and then everyone was like, "Why can't you get good artwork?" Like, right. Hard Case Crime does, and so they've really stepped up their artwork. Game. Yeah, the uh, one you talked about last week, "Dead Wrong" by Larry Holden, had great artwork, and uh, it's miles better than just like a shadow that they used to throw up. On yeah, their yeah. So they're they're good, and I think they realize that people who like vintage paperbacks like vintage paperback art, and they ought to step that up. And they've done a great job. Now, you recently had a run in with some vintage paperbacks that you wanted to talk about, right? I do, yeah, I do. And uh, Tom, I'm going to confess right here. Lay it on me. In front of the hundreds of people that are on their way to work or to the gym. I haven't been the same Eric for the last couple of weeks. I don't feel whole. Something is just, it's just missing. And I think I know what it is. Uh, a few weeks ago, my wife and I were in downtown Jacksonville. And we poked our heads into the Chamberlain's book mine there. And uh, as I mentioned before on the show, it's the smaller of the two locations. In browsing, I spotted some uh, Mickey Splain books, and I fondled them, and I cuddled them, and uh, I cuddled with them for about, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. My wife's getting jealous. And, did you uh, see you cuddled with them? I did. <laughs> I so did. <laughs> and my wife's looking at me like I'm a complete maniac, and uh, she's getting jealous. And I'm getting my wallet, right? <laughs> and it was a beautiful, beautiful set of these Mike Hammer books published by Signet. This is the set, and you've probably seen these, where Spillane's face is in the top left corner, normally in like a yellow square. And then Mickey runs vertically, and Spillane runs horizontally. And they're just absolutely beautiful uh, cover art, beautiful books. And these looked as if the spines had never even been cracked. Uh, they looked like they hadn't even been opened. They were in excellent condition. So I'm hoping for you know the normal $3.50 price that we, that we normally uh, have to pay for paperbacks there. But I opened up the books, Tom, and you've had this feeling before when you see those dreaded light pencil strokes on the first page. Yeah, That sealed my doom, man. The old guy wanted uh, between eight and ten dollars for each book. Really, and, the Champlins? And, and, and Champlins. Huh. And uh, I want to say there was at least six or more there. So spending fifty or sixty bucks on a handful of books that I just fondled in front of my wife probably wasn't something I wanted to do on a Saturday afternoon date with her. So that night and each night thereafter, those books have haunted my very existence. And I wish I had made the right play there, Tom, but I just let it ride. I'm a fool, and I want everyone to know that. <laughs> Tom, have you ever had that situation? Well, uh, yes, and uh, and the COVID nineteen crisis has made me think about it. There's a great bookstore in Chicago that I go to every time I'm in Chicago. It's called the Gallery Bookstore. It, it's basically on Belmont Avenue, right underneath the L tracks there, and um, and they have a fantastic selection of old vintage paperbacks. But he's very, very. Um, I'm trying to think what the way to put it is. Um, condition sensitive. So if they're in really good condition, he's going to, ch- you know, an old Gil Brewer book or a Harry Whittington book is going to cost you 12 to 15 uh. bucks. And I, I'm, I'm such, such a cheapskate. I, I, you know, I buy books every time from this guy every time I go there and have a very nice conversation with him. But I leave so many books on the shelves there. And this guy has been talking about going out of business for the past like 20 years. Like oh, every time I see, I talk to this guy, he's like, he's like yeah, I don't know if we're going to make it much longer. <laughs> <laughs> and they're raising my rent. And, you know, but people aren't buying books anymore. But every time I go back, he's there. I haven't looked to see if Gallery Bookstore is still open and running because Chicago has been pretty tight with the COVID thing. Oh, yeah. And my fear is that he actually did go out of business or is about to go out of business. I have no plans to return to Chicago imminently. And so I'm terrified that all those books are just going to end up going into some box in a storage unit and they will not be part of my collection here. Yeah. Um, 
Did you get any? Have you bought any books lately? Yeah. So I got two old paperbacks I wanted to highlight. The first is a Western by Elmore Leonard, uh, written in 1959. I got a reprint of it. The Last Stand at Saber River. It's about a guy named Cable who fought for the South in the Civil War, who returns home after the war and finds that his home and his ranch have been overrun by Yankee sympathizers. Their horses are grazing in his meadow, and they basically tell Cable to move on or die. And Cable declares a one-man war on these people. I absolutely hate Elmore Leonard's crime fiction with a laser-like passion. And people disagree with me on that, and I'll go round and round with you. I think the guy's a hack. But his westerns are awesome. He was really something special. There's this great compilation. I don't know. Do you have, do you have this? Here, take this. I'm handing this across. I can't here. lift it. I know. There's this great compilation of Elmore Leonard's Western short stories called The Complete Western Stories of Elmore Leonard. And it's awesome. Every story in it is just amazing. Even if you don't love Elmore Leonard um, you know, as a crime writer, you should check out his Westerns. And if you don't love Westerns or know where to start in the Western genre, and I hear this from people, short stories are a great way to get your feet wet, and Elmore Leonard's about as good as they come. So I got that Elmore Leonard book. Again, it's Last Stand at Sabre River, and it's going to be a nice little companion piece to my short story collection. I also got this book. You ever seen this? It's called Levine. Do you have, ever seen that? No. It's by Donald Westlake. And, of course, listeners know that Donald Westlake was a great crime fiction author who wrote the Parker series of books under the uh, name Richard Stark. Anyway, Westlake had a series that not many people know about because the stories in that series unfolded in a series of short stories appearing in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine and one appeared in Mike Shane Mystery Magazine between the years 1959 and 1965. The the stories all star Abe Levine, an NYPD cop with a bad heart, like every heartbeat that he has could be his last. And this affects his investigations in weird ways, I guess. Anyway, the Abe Levine stories were compiled into one volume called Levine, released by Tor Books in 1985 with a very unremarkable cover. For reasons unclear to me, the book has not been re-released since then, um, at a time where Westlake's estate has been making everything available digitally or paperback reprints. I'm just glad to own a copy, and I'm going to read and review that for sure because I'm a huge Westlake fan, and I didn't even know this book existed. So uh, that's what I've been buying. Um, anything else or feature time? Let's do it. Okay, play that funky transition music, White Boy. All right, feature today is about Ken Crossan. Kendall Foster Crossan was born in 1910 in Ohio. His parents were farmers, and he was a good football player. That's real football, Eric, not soccer. And he went to Rio Grande College on a football scholarship. Now, after college, he wrote several one-act plays that were produced at a small theater in Cleveland, Ohio. And you'll be surprised to learn that you don't make a ton of money doing that. Uh, So what Crossan does, what every young man does under similar circumstances, he joins the circus. He was a tumbling clown for the Tom Mix Circus for a single season, And he transitions into a tent show where he's basically doing stand-up comedy with a partner, and he was a huckster at a medicine show. And eventually, when the thrill of the road wore off, he went back to Cleveland, and he worked as an investigator for an insurance company. And this is significant because it plants the seed for what's later going to become his most successful character, an insurance investigator named Milo March. Now, over time, he grows tired of working for an insurance company, Can you imagine actually growing tired of working for an insurance company, Eric? Daily. (laughs) (laughs) You may know a thing or two about that. So what March does, because he's this, you know, man of the world and something you don't have the guts to do, is he buys a typewriter and he hitchhikes to New York City. Now, this is in the 1930s during the Great Depression, and President Franklin D. Roosevelt had an employment program called the Works Project Administration, or the WPA, that paid writers to keep them occupied and funnel money into the economy. Working for the WPA Writers Project, Crossan authored a New York City guidebook, and he was also assigned to write about the sport of cricket in New York, something that he neither knew nor cared about. In 1936, he answers a, dig this, a help-wanted ad in the New York Times seeking an associate editor for the pulp magazine Detective Fiction Weekly. Would that be the greatest job to get from a yeah, class? Really. <laughs> I'd jump all over that. He gets the job. And so um, he said the pay was lousy. 
But he sees that freelance writers were submitting short stories, were making about two cents a word, and making more money than he was as the associate editor. So Crossan quits his job in uh, at Detective Fiction Weekly and moves to... It's a pattern, man. I guarantee he moved to Florida. <laughs> he, correct the mundo. He moved to Florida, and he started writing short stories. He sold his first batch of short stories to his old employer, Detective Fiction Weekly. Now, the publication eventually coaxes him back to work with the offer of more money to make him the full-on chief editor of the Pulp magazine. And so he leaves Florida, which must have been a very sad day, and moves back to New York to edit the magazine at day while he's writing short stories at night. He was writing so many short stories around that window of time that he'd have multiple stories in the same issue of one pulp magazine or another. So he started employing pseudonyms because it looks super lame in the table of contents to have six of the seven stories in any magazine by Ken Crossan. So it becomes Richard Foster or Bennett Barclay or other names that are probably long forgotten. All this brings us to his first successful series character, The Green Llama. For the sake of our listeners, that's llama as in Dalai Lama, not llama as in like an alpaca. Uh, Brian Ritt of Paperback Confidential says, and I have no reason to doubt him, that the Green Lama was the only Buddhist superhero to grace the pages of a pulp magazine. Now, the boss of Detective Fiction Weekly, which is owned by a parent company called Muncie's, called Crossan and told him that he wanted Crossan to create a series character to compete with The Shadow, which was a monster hit at the time. Around that time, Crossan reads a newspaper article about a New Yorker who flew to Tibet and studied Lamaism um, while lecturing uh, in New York about Buddhist practices. Crossan must have thought this sounded very interesting and exotic, so he conceives of a character called the Gray Lama. The problem is that gray looks terrible on magazine covers. It doesn't pop. So Crossan changes the character to the Green Lama because green is also a sacred color among llamas, evidently. The character of the Green Llama, his real name is Jethro Dumont, and he achieves his superpowers through a combination of Buddhist studies and radioactive salts. Makes perfect sense. His main power was the ability to shock someone by touching them. He wrote 14 Green Llama stories in a pulp called Double Detective under the name Richard Foster. Now, the character actually ultimately became a comic book character in 1944, and Crossan contributed stories to the comic books as well. I think there may have been a radio show at some point, but Crossan wasn't involved. Now, the Green Llama stories are available today, as you know, in three volumes of compilations from Altus Press, and they're like $5 on Kindle. Now, you read one of them and reviewed it, right? I've got a lot of patience for the pulp stuff. Um, you know, I, re- I read and review more than you do with the Doc Savage and Avenger and that kind of stuff, but I really liked it. I thought it was really fun. Good. Okay, so Crossan eventually becomes a full-time writer again. He quits his editing job, and he does very well writing comic book stories, including Captain Marvel, Superman, and Batman. He finds success also writing the script for mystery radio shows, many of which were adapted from existing stories by Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler. This brings us up to 1952. Crossan was getting restless and decided to write his first novel. He invented a character named Milo March, an insurance investigator, just like he had been for a while, uh, because they say you should write what you know. He writes his first Milo March book called Hangman's Harvest, and it must have done well enough to spawn a series. The Milo March series, Eric, ran for 22 books and a handful of short stories between 1952 and 1973. And actually, they're currently being reprinted by Steger Books. They were originally written under the pseudonym of M.E. Chaber, which is a bit of a pun because Mechaber or Mechaber is either Hebrew or Yiddish for the word writer. If you want to seek out the old paperbacks, you need to find them under the M.E. Chaber name, whereas the Steger Books reprints are under Crossan's own name. Uh, Milo March, the character, he's an investor for a Denver-based intercontinental insurance. Now, he used to be an OSS operative, and that was the precursor to the CIA during World War II. So some of the Milo March books are straight-up mysteries, usually property crimes, like find the stolen diamond so the insurance company doesn't have to pay a claim. But others are spy stories when, for one reason or another, Army intelligence uh, presses March back into service for a spy mission. I read one of them, and I'm going to share my impressions of it later in the show. Now, they have a reputation for being lighthearted and a bit wisecracky at times. No one puts them in the top tier of series characters from that era, but I think everybody agrees that they're a lot of fun, and Crossan was really a good writer. 
Uh, he did a ton of research for the Milo March books, making sure that the street names and hotel names were accurate in these globe-trotting adventures. Interestingly, Cross and himself hated flying, so he never traveled abroad. He used to say, once you've seen one cloud, you've seen them all. The character of Milo March eventually moves from Denver to New York City in the series. The books have been reprinted several times. Our listeners may be familiar with the paperback library reprints from the 1970s. I'm going to hand these over to you. Do you have any of these? Yes. All right, so you do. So you've seen these with these covers drawn by Robert McGinnis. As often happens, Paperback Library renumbered the series for the reprints. Um, and so the numbers uh, on the Paperback Library with the McGinnis covers bear zero resemblance to the actual series order. But it does, appears to not matter at all. You can read these books in any order. Uh, there's actually a Milo March movie, a British film called The Man Inside, starring Jack Palance as March. Uh, Crossan wrote another series under the name of Christopher Monig about another insurance investigator named Brian Brett. I have a couple of those, but I haven't read them. They were also reprinted with the same cover scheme as the Milo March series, and the numbering is even weird because there were only a handful of those um, Brian Brett books, and uh, but they're numbered like 23 and 24 and 25 um, as part of a uh, as, as if they were part of the Milo March series. But so it doesn't make a gosh darn bit of sense. And the covers of the paperback um, library say it's M. E. Chaber writing as Christopher Monig, which is funny because it was actual Ken Ken Crossan writing as Christopher Monig uh, for the. Um, those books. It was just a weird situation. Crossan had another series under his own name starring a dude named Kim Locke, who is a U.S. Army intelligence agent who worked with a dog. I don't know much about that series. Um, he wrote at least two books here that I have. I want to hand them over to you that he wrote under the name Richard Foster. One is a science fiction book, and the other is called Beer for a Chaser. Um, both Fawcett Gold Medal. They both look kind of good. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. He died at age 71 in Los Angeles in 1981. The curator of his uh, literary estate is a really nice uh, lady named Ken- Kendra, his daughter, uh, with whom I've corresponded a bit. She recommended that for the uninitiated, the best Milo March books to start with. And this is coming from his daughter, who's working, who worked hard on getting these books back in print with the Steger books thing. She said the best books that are, number two, No Grave for March. Number three, The Man Inside. Number five, The Splintered Man. Number six, A Lonely Walk. Number nine, So Dead the Rose. And number 17, Wild Midnight Falls. I want to credit a 1975 interview with Crossan by Steve Lewis, published in The Mystery Nook. The interview has been reprinted by Steger Books as an afterword to their printing of No Grave for March. You should check that out. I also use Brian Ritt's Paperback Confidential and good old Wikipedia to fill in the gaps for this feature. So uh, that's all I got on Ken Crossan until I come back later for a uh, review. Why don't you go ahead with your review, and then I'll circle back and give you my impressions of the Milo March book I read. Okay, great. Yeah, looking forward to your thoughts on the Milo March book. I have one or two of those, and I've, I've never read them, uh, but uh, they've always been on my radar to read. My review today, though, is the Motor City Blue novel by Lauren D. Estelman. Estelman wrote and still writes a ton of westerns. About half the books make up the Page Murdoch series, starring U.S. Deputy Marshal Paige Murdoch. But Esselman also wrote some Sherlock Holmes books. He did a series of historical books about Detroit. The author himself is from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and he's really astute on all things Detroit. In the mid-'80s, the author launched a series of action novels about a mob hitman named Peter Macklin. I've never read these, but hopefully in a future podcast episode we can dissect Esselman's entire catalog and highlight key entries. Tom, did you, have you ever read Peter Macklin? I have not. I, I've had the first one on my like priority to read list for probably a couple of years now, and I got to get to it. It's I just every time I need to pick up a Hitman book, I tend to pick up a Quarry exactly. book, exactly. Right, but they look like they're great, and they got a good yeah. reputation. Paul Bishop uh, likes them. He told me they were good. Okay, uh, well, Esselman's most praised literary work is probably his Amos Walker mystery series. Uh, the character was first introduced in 1980s Motor City Blue, and has remained a highly regarded character through 28 books. Unfamiliar with Walker, I uh, started at the beginning. So Motor City Blue introduces readers to Amos Walker. Based on the name, I had associated Amos with African American. But shame on me, Amos Walker is Caucasian. He's a three-year veteran of the Vietnam War who experienced a ton of heated action in and around Cambodia. After Vietnam, Esselman became an MP and then later joined a Detroit Police Academy as a civilian. 
But after being fondled in the shower, or, or, or attempted to be fondled in the shower by another trainee, Walker defensively beats up the guy, and he's booted from the academy. So his next logical c- career choice at this point was simply to do a private eye gig, which he uh, does and does well. In the series' debut, Walker is 32 years old, and he'll age as the series progresses. The novel's opening pages finds Walker working an assignment for an insurance company. He's armed with a camera and a Smith & Wesson revolver, and Walker's photographing a man who may be faking an injury for claim money. But while working the assignment, Walker witnesses his old army captain being thrust into the back seat of a sedan by two burly men. Walker calls his best friend, a police lieutenant named John Arterdice, to report the incident. It's an early, key event that'll play a much larger role in the story's finale. But later, Walker is summoned to meet a former Bob, mob boss named Ben Morningstar. This elderly retired gangster hires Walker to track down and locate a young woman named Marla. Morningstar raised Marla, and he's been, uh, he's been financing her college expenses. But he learns that she's abruptly dropped out of school. So since then, she's seemingly disappeared, and Morningstar doesn't really trust the police to search for her. You know, he's a retired gangster. He's, he's probably got some ill will towards the law enforcement. So Morningstar shows Walker a photo of Marla that indicates that she's entered the sleazy world of pornography, either voluntarily or against her will. So it's up to Walker to find Marla and determine just how she finds herself working in the, uh, in the smut industry. Motor City Blues is a really enthralling mystery. Uh, it features a lot of the same private eye tropes that have been utilized since the 1940s. Esselman isn't reinventing the genre, and uh, I don't think he proclaims to be. He's just presenting readers the traditional P.I. formula, procedural investigation done by a, you know, a valid, sarcastic hero. And, and with these P.I.s, it seems like they always use uh, somebody in law enforcement. So in this case, he's got a police friend, an ally, that he goes to for all the tips and tricks. Esselman's placement of the entire series in Detroit is fitting, considering the author's uh, scholarly knowledge of the city and all its history. Uh, in Motor City Blue, the author submerges the readers into the porn industry, uh, complete with all the uh, you know the normal stuff that you get with that smut shops, adult theaters, sleazy trailers, and all the criminal elements that are often found on, uh, I guess, on that side of the tracks. But Amos Walker may be the best of the 1980s private eye characters. As an early introduction to the character and author, readers unfamiliar with this series pr- should probably start here. With all the spiraling mystery, I think action fans will still appreciate the gunplay and all the fisticuffs that Amos Walker brings. Uh, but it was a really good read, and uh, I think it's it's gained acclaim for a good reason. Again, this is uh, the Amos Walker mystery series, book number one, Motor City Blue by uh, Lauren D. Estelman. You ever been to Detroit? Never. My wife's family's from there, so I've spent uh, oh. way too much time in Detroit. And it's it's a city that has just been, like, ravaged. Like, there's nobody right. there. So I read a book by um, Lauren Estelman in 1992 that he wrote. It was a standalone novel called King of the Corner. And uh, it was about a Detroit Tigers uh, baseball pitcher who, a fiction, of course, who went to prison on a morals rap, gets out of prison, and he's sort of dealing with, like, a new Detroit. Like, um, and, hmm. and he kind of falls. He's trying to stay on the straight and narrow, but he uh, ends up falling into a life of crime yeah. again, basically. He's a, a driver for an Underwood char- underworld character. It's a really good book. The title, King of the Corner, though, is interesting because what happened to Detroit was um, two things hit at once. There was a, very, a, a bad and kind of somewhat corrupt mayor who ran the city into the ground and, and combined with white flight where white people were just leaving the city in droves to move out to the suburbs. And so the city itself, and unlike other cities that have experienced that, a lot of the industry in the city of Detroit also moved out to the suburbs. And so Detroit is 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 and was a wasteland. Like you could literally be walking in the middle of downtown in the middle of the day and not see a single person. And the buildings oh, are just wow. burned out buildings. It's, just, it's crazy. Like the population like has been cutting in half like every decade that they've been doing censuses for years. So the concept behind King of the Corner is, uh, and the, this is a part of the book, is that the there's – uh, reporters for the Detroit Free Press who would go out to lunch um, in uh, and it, as they were walking to lunch, you, if you went to a street corner in the heart of downtown Detroit and you stood in that street corner and you could see in all four directions 
down the streets and not see another human being, you were king of the corner for that day. Oh, wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, interesting. It was a good book, too. It's definitely worth reading. Huh. And, uh, and Lauren Esselman's really, really highly regarded. I would imagine as that series progresses, um, you probably learn a lot about Detroit's downfall. Definitely. I mean, in King of the Corner, it would really dealt with that. The uh, the former mayor there, Coleman Young, the one who uh, caused all the problems um, there, is what people would tell you. Uh, there's a, a character in King of the Corner that's basically Coleman Young under a different name. Oh. And it get, gets into the kind of the corruption and sort of what in Detroit's downfall. And hmm. so it's just a great book. I'm going to review, um, at the suggestion of Ken Crossan's daughter, Kendra, I read the second book in the Milo March series, No Grave for March from 1953. Uh, the Paperback Library 1970 reprint lists this book as number eight in the series. They're wrong. I'm right. It was number two. Uh, no Grave for March is an international spy adventure paperback. And as the novel opens, Milo March has been away from the spy business for seven years. He's summoned to a clandestine meeting in Washington, D.C. from an, with an old colleague from his war days. It seems that a diplomat with a head full of secrets has defected to the Soviet client state of East Germany. Now, because March speaks German, he's the choice to slip behind the Iron Curtain, kidnap the diplomat, and bring him back to the West. Now, one of the secrets at stake that this diplomat's aware of is a mind control device that can reprogram the public to either love Stalin or apple pie, depending on who's pulling the trigger. Now, the author, uh, Crossan, put some actual thought into his work with summaries of communist theory embedded into the plot lines and interesting historical tidbits. This isn't a work of genius, but it's not completely disposable fiction. However, it's also not really a, sh- a fast-moving shoot 'em up paperback. Milo March spends a good bit of the novel just trying to convince the commies that he's one of them and not an American spy. I found this fascinating, but it really wasn't a breakneck, like Nick Carter, Killmaster-style thrill ride. Crossan also had a really annoying habit of writing lots of dialogue in German and Russian with no translation. You know, like in italics. So you get the gist, but why are you bothering showing off like this for American readers? There's lots of specifics about East, the East German Communist Party, their tactics, their ambitions, the party machinations that you're either going to find interesting or not. Now, things become very exciting in the novel's final act with this pulpy action sequence, which is one of the best I've read. It was fantastic. But I wish the rest of the paperback had set pieces as thrilling as the conclusion. Uh, Despite some missteps along the way, I genuinely enjoyed No Grave for March, and I look forward to exploring more of the series in the future. Again, I want to thank Steger House for hooking me up with the e-books and the reprints. Uh, You should definitely check them out. Steger House always does a, a nice job. All right, well, we're out of time. That's it for this episode. We really appreciate you listening to our show and supporting us. Again, follow us on paperbackwarrior.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well. And we'll be back again next week with another exciting episode. All right, this is Tom. Be cool. Bye-bye now.